In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Kindly take 1st Corinthians chapter 13. 1st Corinthians chapter 13. The first three verses. 1st Corinthians 13. First three verses. If I speak in human and angelic tongues, but do not have love, I am a resounding gown and a clashing symbol. And if I have the gift of prophecy and comprehend all mysteries and all knowledge, if I have all faith so as to move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give away everything I own, and if I hand my body over so that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Let us pray. God our Father, at St. Paul's Bible College, we have come together for our monthly lecture to reflect on the letters of St. Paul to the Corinthians, the first and the second. We pray that having gathered together on the Sunday of the Passion of your only begotten Son, we may continue to be enriched by the love that you have shown us through him. And we may continue to imitate the love, say, by applying the principle of love commandment in our own day-to-day -day dealings. We make this prayer through Christ our Lord. Amen. 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 Good evening. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining this lecture. Yes. As we are our Sunday, the last Sunday falls on the Easter Sunday. We have made it today, anticipating it a week before. Thank you for joining us. Good. To the students who are part of St. Paul's Bible College, who are doing this as diploma, at the end of the lesson, there will be assessment question. Today, we are going to discuss about the first Corinthians and the second Corinthians. We have discussed in the past lecture on the letter of Paul to the Romans and Galatians. And following that, this is about the church in Corinth. Good. With this little background, we enter into the lesson proper. So the lesson is relatively simpler, so we may have to dedicate only the first hour. We'll see how it goes. Good. I share my screen with you. I hope you are able to view my screen. First yes, and Father. second Corinthians, thank you. Lesson 22 of our course. To recapitulate, in our previous lecture on Paul's writing or Paul's epistles, we had said Paul's seven church letters. We, in fact, wanted to situate where these churches are. So we, in fact, began with number one, Rome, the letter to the Romans, then Corinth. Today, our focus will be here, Corinth. Then other letters are Thessalonica, Philippi, Ephesus, Colossae, and Galatia. So we, in fact, have seen letter of Paul to the Romans and the Galatians because we took them together or unless they reflect on the same theme of justification through faith. Today we are going to kind of a different uh, type of letter whereby not only there is a theological treatise on different things but also practical concerns are dealt with. So that way today's lecture will give a new understanding about Paul's letters. That today we are going to see two letters, first letter to the Corinthians, the second letter to the Corinthians. Good. Let us begin with a historical account. Corinth was a business capital in Greece. Like we have different capitals in a country, for example, in a state, the capital could be for administrative purposes or sometimes spiritual purposes, as in Jerusalem, Israel had. Jerusalem as its capital, not only for its administration, but also for its cult. So the capital could be cultic or economic or political, administrative. But when it comes to Corinth, it was a business capital in Greece. A lot of business transactions took place in Corinth. And in fact, there was an idiom to Corinthianize, which would simply mean like to have a kind of a easy way of life or to have a way of life that is spendthrift and the way that is kind of extravagant. So that type of 
lifestyle was attributed to Corinth, and mostly people were educated on account of the Greek philosophy, the dominance of it. Then the Corinthian church was always a pebble in Paul's shoes. In the sense, Paul loved the church so much, however, he had to encounter constant problems from there on account of two things. Number one, the practical difficulties they had in forming the community, as we will see today shortly, the problem of idolatry or the problem of Eucharist. Secondly, when Paul's absence was there, different preachers came into being, and they in fact questioned Paul's authentic discipleship or Paul's apostleship as the, the apostle to the Gentiles. So Paul had to handle these two issues, one to do with the problems of the church, and another to do with the external forces that were influencing the church. So that way, Corinth was a pebble in Paul's shoes. But it was a vibrant community. So from the fact that we are able to see many problems were there, we can see the problem was that the church was very vibrant. Because when the church is lively, usually there are problems or there are shortcomings. When the church is dormant or when the church is dead, no one really cares. So be a, because of the problems, we are, we are able to uh, decipher that the church in Corinth might have been a vibrant community. Then Paul's response to issues, that is about 1st Corinthians, as I said earlier, different issues. One example could be idolatry, or food offered to idols. So some issues are there, and Paul addresses the issues in the 1st Corinthians. When it comes to the 2nd Corinthians, Mostly, this is a letter of self-explanation, whereby Paul engages in a discussion where to, he needs to tell or he needs to explain about himself, about his ministry, about his call, and about all he has been doing all along as the apostle of Christ. So that way, this becomes kind of a self-explanatory letter, the second Corinthians. Coming to the theological context. The first problem or the first contextual element could be factions in the ecclesial community. Factions emerging on account of clinging to one person here. Like in the beginning of the letter itself, we have this dissension or faction where people are divided on account of the gospels they received. Some were for Kephas, that is Simon Peter, some for Apollos, some for Peter. So maybe in a, like a parish context, if you see, like there have been different parish priests in a parish community, naturally one group would follow one parish priest, another group would follow another parish priest, and they will have a liking for another parish priest. Or in the context of a universal church, we can say, like some are very close to John Paul II, and some like Benedict XVI, and some are for Pope Francis. So like suppose after a few years, if you look back again, like people are divided not on the not on account of the papacy or on account of the different popes or in a parish community or on account of different parish priests. This comes because of our life and dislike and because of our clinging on to a particular person. Same thing happens in the Corinthian community where after Paul leaving the place, or Peter, Apollo leaving the place, people tend to follow or form their own groups. So these groups were based on personal clinging or personal identity of a particular person. So Paul has to handle this particular problem of action or dissension community. The second one was misunderstanding about charisms, like different gifts. So by charism, we need to understand as gift. People had different gifts. For example, one had the gift of prophecy, so which means that person will be able to foretell. Or one person had the gift of speaking in tongues. Or one person would, would have the uh, charism of teaching or healing. So now different people are there with different charisms. I think this can happen in a kind of a particular parish community, whereby one charism is treated with respect and another charism is treated with not so not so much of respect. So this, in fact, this is the context which, with which we are reflecting the synodality. In the synodality or in the synodal church, our Holy Father wants that the charisms and the hierarchy, they must go together. 
So here in the problem in the Corinthian communities, people had different charisms, but they were not able to really understand and use the charisms for the common good of the community. They were using them for their own individual purposes. So now Paul has to kind of uh, create a theology whereby he tells that all the charisms are for the common good. That's the second problem. The third one, theological issues concerning idols. Idols, like earlier, the Corinthian community had its own idols or its own gods. So now when you come into Christianity, you do away with idols. But still you have a kind of a, a kind of attraction or a kind of a, uh, you need to go there. For example, let's take an example of a Hindu person in a Indian or a Malaysian community where he or she becomes a Christian, but all along her life or from her childhood, she or he, they have been accompanying with these idols. So now how do they look at these idols once they get into Catholicism after being baptized? Can they really go back with their parents or with their relatives or they have to cling on to Christianity or clinging on to this religion, leaving alone all the idols? Suppose it happens in a, community, in a festive context, there comes the problem. Suppose your mother brings, a, a brings food or prasad from the temple, but you are a Catholic and your teaching tells that this is kind of food offered to idols. So now, how will we Take, how will we take this particular particular food? Can we really accept it or we can't accept it? So now there comes the problem, theological issue concerning idol. Then so the same thing happened for the Corinthian church, like people had to handle this problem of idols, especially food offered to idols. The second problem was last supper, like the Eucharist, the breaking of the bread in the Acts of the Apostles we see, like the uh, breaking of the bread was one of the symbols. So now breaking of the bread slowly kind of a it became a kind of a cultic thing. People forgot its true uh, dimension, the social dimension, and they just wanted to keep it kind of a yellow to worship food. So that problem was there as a last supper. That's the problem Paul had to handle. Then problem of love, love in the context of factions, dissensions, and we can say still about idols. Then even about fornication, like different se uh, sexual aberrations where they all had to handle. Then the reconciliation and vocation, they are the problems in the second Corinthians, whereby Paul begins to tell that he is the apostle of reconciliation or a minister of rec reconciliation. And in fact, Paul has to authenticate himself, his, his vocation, and Paul uses a very good metaphor of treasure in uh, the part. Then Paul had to handle the opponents, so which we are not really sure who are the opponents, except for a few names from the letters here. And later from the letters to Timothy and Titus, we are not really sure about the opponents of Paul. But however, we can really know that some opponents were there. And some people say there were letters written by Paul, but they were lost. And they were lost because Paul makes a mention of it, but we really don't have them in the Bible. So because of that, we can say some letters are lost. Some say there were four letters to the Corinthians, but only two are found in the Bible. Good. Coming to the literary style, response to the problems reported. So Paul has a kind of a family, uh, two or three persons. They report to Paul about the happenings in the church in Corinth and Paul responds. Secondly, the style of the letters, both the first and the second Corinthians, they are of an exhortatory or a kind of advice giving style. Thirdly, we also find a kind of a theological style whereby Paul makes a theology on love, reconciliation, suffering and giving. Good. So, before we go to the second one, I pause here for a moment to collect your doubts or your questions on first and second Corinthians. If you have, like we might have heard of these letters earlier, we we'll try to see our own insights and questions on first and second Corinthians. I pause here. You are welcome to share and ask. You could unmute. Huh? 
Yeah, Father Vinny. Yes, uh, Mr. Kumar. Yeah, I have a doubt. Uh, you yeah. might also come across this kind of this kind of question. Even okay. our uh, our shrine uh, kept in our Catholic churches. Now we are also questioning that we are worshiping the idols. Okay. So in what way? In what way we can uh, convince them that uh, we are like a, we don't worship? It, it is not called as a uh, idol worship. Okay. How to convince them for, uh, and uh, justify our uh, shrine in the churches? Okay, good. Thank you, Mr. Vikmar. We'll take it. The question of idol. Okay, how do we uh, justify like different images that we have, either in the form of a picture or in the form of a statue? Very good. Thank you. Anyone else? Any insight or any question you would like to share with the entire group? Father. Yes, Mr. Manuel. Uh, some said, in fact, uh, a letter to second, second Corinthians uh, is comprised of uh, three letters in, yeah. due to contrast in different tones. Chapter okay. 1 to 7, conciliatory tone is there. Correct. Chapters uh, 10 to 13, confrontation tone was there. And in between 8 to 9, some sort of generosity giving and all that. Uh, so contrasting tones are there. So some people say that the two letters may be clubbed in this uh, second letter. OK. Yes, Mr. Emmanuel. Thank you for, yeah, thank you for the question. We will clarify it. Thank you. Very good. Anyone else? One more thing, Father. Yes, Mr. Emmanuel. For the first Corinthians seventh chapter, thirty-six to thirty-eight. Okay. There did Paul counsels uh, the father of the girl because it is mentioned in Greek uh, as virgin. Mm. That betrothed is mentioned as virgin. Yeah. So is he counsels the father of the girl? It is shown like that in BSI, Bible Society okay. of India Bible. Okay. Or the man who engages the girl, mm -hmm. just as and in our Bibles, it is like that. Yeah. Yes, it is what you say is like in, uh, in my the translation that I have, it tells if anyone thinks he is behaving improperly towards his virgin. So what's yeah. the text in your proposed text, BSI? First for in the end, seven. Yeah, yes. Uh, if anyone thinks that he is not behaving properly towards his betroth, this is BSI father. Ah, okay. So betroth, it is uh, mentioned in the footnote virgin. In Greek, it is virgin. Okay. So in BSI Bible, it is uh, mentioned as father, as a counsel to the father of the girl. Ah, okay, okay, good. But in our Bible, in Alexis. It is mentioned as uh, the man, P and C, who betrothed her. Okay. Like the actually the passage. Okay, we'll take it up. Okay, good. Thank you. Right. Uh, one more thing, Father. Yeah. First Corinthians fifteen twenty nine. One second. First Corinthians fifteen twenty nine. Okay. Is it mentioning uh, what is the meaning that baptism to the dead? Ah, okay. We'll take it. And how is it related to the uh, Gregorian masses being offered by us to our uh, departed dearly ones? Okay, good. Thank you. Good. Thank you, Mr. Manuel. Okay. Very good. Anyone else would like to share any insight on first and second Corinthians, which you might have heard earlier? Are the text you like the most? One Wait. more thing, Father. First okay, Corinthians 15, Father. 
first Corinthians 3.15. Yeah. Is it mentioning purgatory, Father? First one minute, let me take the text. First Corinthians. You read for us? Father? Please read the text for us. 3.15. If any man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. Okay. And does it uh, any symbolize that uh, purgatory for? Okay, good. Thank you. In fact, it talks about proving one's work. Good. Very good. Thank you. Okay. Good. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Emmanuel. Thank you, Mr. Ravi Kumar, for the questions. Good. So with these questions, we enter into the discussion. Good. So the, the first question by Mr. Ravi Kumar about idols. So now, how do we understand the images that we are using or we keep in our churches or in our shrines? The images of the saints or Blessed Virgin Mary or even images of Jesus. So do we really consider them as idols? Good. So the question is here about how we see or how do we theologize? Our Catholic Church understands these images not as idols. Okay. So kind of they are only they remind us about God. So that way when we worship, we really don't worship. But however, in certain circumstances, we use them as idols. For example, uh, in the holy mass after the, the at the Easter, at the end of the mass, the priest blesses the congregation with kind of with a statue of the child Jesus, the baby Jesus, or even our veneration of the cross or somebody or after the after our stations of the cross, the Via Crucis, we also bless the people with the cross, which means and when we carry the statue of our lady or the saints in procession during their feast, we incense them or we touch their feet and we kiss them. So this now how do we understand? First, we need to understand, like, first one, they are, they kind of, uh, the church clearly tells that they are not images, okay? So, which, they are not idols. They are only images that they, they invoke in us. So, even when there is a blessing of any statue, the prayer beautifully tells, looking at them, we will be reminded of their virtues. So, that is the, the purpose of keeping our statues or images. But, but sometimes the purpose is not are not kept that's a different question but otherwise the purpose is that they remind us about the heavenly virtues in every one of us number one number two for sentimental reasons or for cultural reasons the church allows that these practices could be kept like in the pious or pious devotions or popular devotion that way the church holds that these are not idols they are only images however uh, depending on the cultural context of the people, the church still allows space for kind of a treating that particular image as an idol. So we must be always sure that we must always keep our minds on Jesus. So today, like the Palm Sunday, oftentimes we are just focusing ourselves on getting the palm, keeping it in our family or keeping it in our home. But the ultimate aim of Palm Sunday is not that we get the palms and we keep it and that throughout the year we keep for protection or like I mean, we treat it as a kind of a totem. So the, the meaning is that we enter into the Holy Week. It's a kind of a symbol. Oftentimes what happens, we leave out the message and cling on to the symbol because it is easy for us to cling on to the symbol. And today in some churches, I heard like people were fighting to get, get their palms, which means uh, Jesus came to establish love but we set aside the quality of love and understanding. So each one tries to grab as many palms as possible, which means uh, like it's a kind of you grab for yourself. Like the message of the cross or the message of the Holy Week is just missing. So this is how often we go away when we take, when we take any idol or any image. I think we go in a far extreme and we leave out the message and we cling on only to the symbols. I think we need to be very careful. Good. Coming to the questions are uh, the first question from the father, father yes. please can i add one thing further whether it is correct yes. or not yes, uh, yes, in yes. lxx the first law come ten commandments first commandment the first commandment in uh, hebrew bible is divided into two okay 
so that uh, gives the sense uh, that uh, our uh, first commandment sense means accept accept i nothing should be there uh, when it is divided into in hebrew bible it applies to the god uh, more so jesus and mary they came into the world so in uh, our uh, human form so it uh, as you said uh, it is not as a talisman or any shakti it is a veneration yeah good thank you sir. thank you maharaj thank you good so we got even this first question about the second corinthians some scholars say depending on the internal evidence that's the the text the text of the particular letter the genre they say like there are different types as he has mentioned conciliatory tone comfort, uh, comforting tone and kind of a contrary contrary contradictory tone so it, different tones like this like in scholar's opinion but here we as i said earlier Paul mentions about previous letters. So two things we can say. One, Paul has written other letters which are not found. On the other hand, in a letter itself, there is a possibility of one thing being added and another thing being removed. So that's a possibility that we can we can derive from the internal evidence. Good. Coming to First Corinthians seven thirty six. So the text is little problematic because a man marrying a virgin so it's like kind of an incest relationship it talks so whether it it talks to paul talks to the within a within a family within a family means it is incest for example a father can't marry his daughter or does he refer to a kind of a husband wife relationship which we because we are now distant from corinthian culture and paul so we can really never know what paul meant that's a, a difficult text of scholars accept this particular text as a difficult text to interpret that's why different bibles have different versions coming to first corinthians 3:15 paul uses the image of fire that in a way testifies which work is good which work is not good i think here paul does not make a reference to purgatory because during paul's time this concept of purgatory was not there and even in judaism this concept of purgatory was not there so paul might not have intended what paul intends here is a kind of a idiomatic expression whereby a proof that's a, even in marcus aurelius or even in plato we have this where any work has to be put in fire which means has to be tested so that's a kind of a idiom paul uses so we need to take it to be the mention about the purgatory good so with this we'll just get into the first corinthians kindly take your bible Kindly take your Bible. We'll run through, see the problems there. Then we'll come to the significance. Please take your Bible, First Corinthians, chapter one. Good. Sorry, Father. One more thing, Father. First yes, Corinthians, fifteen twenty-nine. Yeah. Baptism to the dead. Ah, okay. We'll come to that. Okay. Thank uh, we, uh, you. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Okay. Thank you, Manu. Good. Please take First Corinthians one. it begins with a greeting paul called to be an apostle of christ jesus by the will of god and sustainers our brother so here the another like a kind of a paul together writes with sustainers whom we find in the acts of the apostles then paul as thanksgiving then immediately he talks about disorders in the corinthian community the first disorder is divisions we have in chapter 1 then onwards especially here we see in 112 i belong to paul i belong to apollos i belong to kephas or i belong to christ so paul curiously asks is christ divided was paul crucified for you or were you baptized in the name of paul so like that he continues and finally he gives like each one is given a work and that particular person does the work so that way Paul insists on Christ and Christ work not on the individual people who will take the credit good that's about chapter 1 coming to chapter 2 please take chapter 2 the true wisdom so the second chapter paul begins to like 
he goes to introduce about the, uh, the cross and he sets the context. That's why we have in uh, 2.14, for to him it is foolishness and he cannot understand it. So he in fact talks about kind of a spiritual uh, background that is necessary to understand the role of Christ. Then in chapter 3, he talks about role of God's ministers. Then towards the end he tells, Everything belongs to you. Paul or Apollos or Kephas are the world and life or death. And you to Christ. So everyone belongs to Christ. Then chapter 4, Paul's life as pattern. He proposes his life to be an example. Then chapter 5, moral disorders. The first one was dissension or the faction. Second one, different types of problem. Chapter 5, he talks about case of incest incest like a sexual relation within a family then lawsuits before unbelievers so the community has problem and you take the problem to kind of a non-believer and Paul tells that you are to judge the world and you shouldn't have problems then answers to the question the questions from the Corinthian community it becomes uh, begins chapter 7 marriage and virginity in a way he talks about celibacy later then chapter 8 offering to idols some practical rules he proposes then 9 paul's rights as an apostle then 10 warning against overconfidence in their faith then later about idolatry then liturgical problems like whether a woman can or a woman should cover her head that is problem in chapter 11 towards the end the lord's supper and how paul tells beautifully how he received the, received the eucharist from the lord then 12 unity and variety so he talks about the image of uh, the body and different parts working together so different charisms being used then chapter 13 the beautiful hymn on love then 14, again, it talks about prophecy and the charism of tongues. Then 15, resurrection of Christ and the problem concerning the resurrection. And 16, Paul tells about his later plans, about his travels. And thus concludes the letter. And here the question was by Mr. Emmanuel again, 15, 29, about somebody receiving baptism for the dead person. So this was a kind of a earlier custom where people would take baptism and in a devil attribute. So now what is the context? How do we understand it? So we must understand. So we take the example of St. Augustine. St. Augustine tells in Confessions. He tells like uh, people will wait till they die. Okay, because the baptism was understood as when you receive baptism, all your sins are cleansed so what people will do till death they will wait so once they get baptized and they are pure and they die they go to heaven so baptism was used kind of as a kind of a utility for reaching heaven but later what happens suppose somebody suddenly dies and people now we think like this person died without receiving baptism so later they develop they developed a custom whereby I can take baptism in the name of a dead person. So my receiving baptism will help him. So that's a kind of like I take a vicarious role. Like I take the role of that particular person. So it's a kind of a vicarious baptism. Or I take that baptism instead of him. Vicarious means instead of. So I take it instead of him. That's the custom. So now how do we take, how do we associate with our celebration of the masses for the dead? So now praying for the dead. So that is the context we have to understand. In the book of Maccabees, we have, we have Judah collecting money to pray for the dead. So our church encourages, we encourages that we pray for the dead, offering them masses. Again, we must remember Christ has died once for all, and that is the topmost sacrifice. Our sacrifice does not add anything. We only repeat the sacrifice and we pray for the dead. So our praying for the dead, our offering of the masses for the dead must be understood as praying for the dead in the context of Maccabees. 
So it's not the Corinthian way of taking baptism. Like I don't, uh, like I don't uh, offer it or I offer it for somebody, but that's a kind of a praying. So I don't take it like a kind of a uh, vicarious as it happened in the church in Corinth. Good. That's a little a difference is there when we understand the masses. Very good. Okay, good. Very good. So now we go to the second Corinthians. Kindly take second Corinthians and we'll come to the significance. Let's take second Corinthians. Chapter one, greeting. So Paul immediately tells an apostle of Christ, Jesus, by the will of God. Then here he adds Timothy. Then immediately Paul talks about the crisis. Crisis between Paul and the Corinthians. So he reminds them about the past relationships. Then the offender, the somebody, I think somebody has caused a problem and Paul is now trying to point out the problem that he had. Then Paul justifies his ministry. He begins to kind of uh, develop a theology of reconciliation based on the Old Testament. Again, it's a kind of a going forth and back. Then integrity in the ministry. Again, Paul talks about this integrity. Then future destiny of all, experience of the ministry. Then resolution of the crisis, Paul's joy in Macedonia. Then chapter eight has a different tone, collection for Jerusalem. He talks about generosity, eight and nine. Then Paul's self-defense, chapter 10, kind of a, it has a different tone altogether. He, Paul is helpless and in his helplessness, he, he tells how he received the apostleship. Then 11 continues, then 12 kind of a boasting, he boasts in Christ. And 13, he concludes. In a way, the conclusion is very hasty. He does not address anyone personally, but just like a general conclusion. So some people say this particular letter was uh, incomplete and somebody had to complete it on behalf of Paul, which we are not sure. Only we can make a hypothesis. Very good. Having said this, we get into the significance. With this, we'll understand some more about the letters good the significance are lessons from first corinthians number one there should be no divisions in the church so that is paul's underlining thesis like no faction no division no dissension because ultimately we must remember the one baptism or one faith not the persons who preached about that baptism or who preached about the Faith. That is number one. Number two, God has given us principles to follow for marriage, divorce, and singleness. So whatever be, whatever state of life we have, we are called to live in that particular vocation. That's why Paul tells, be mindful of the call, call you, which is, with which you will receive. Suppose you have dedicated yourself for chastity, celibacy, it's a religious, consecrated way of life. You cling on to the life. Suppose you choose to remain single, you cling on to the life. Suppose you choose to be married, you cling on to that, giving rights and duties to each person. So according to the status or call of one's life, we must follow what is expected of us. So here kind of a Paul uh, kind of acts like a stoic. So stoics say things like everything has a purpose and everyone is bound to keep up the principles which the universe gives us. That's number two. Number three, we must not be a stumbling block to the weak in the context of food offered to idols. So suppose you feel like the food offered to idols is good for you, you take. And don't force on other people because that person's faith may be weak. So that person may be scandalized or maybe they may feel guilty. So what suits you does not suit others. So you be sensitive. That's the third message. Paul wants us to be sensitive to other people. Number four, the Lord's Supper to be taken with reverence. The Lord's Supper to be taken with reverence. The sense, don't treat the Lord's Supper as a kind of a coming together, eating and drinking, but there we commemorate Jesus' death and resurrection. 
and his, we await for we await his second coming so that way that must be a kind of a spiritual experience so we need to treat the last lord supper that is the eucharist with reverence and respect number five love is the goal of spiritual gifts so paul in a way he glorifies love and paul uses the word agape there are four words relating to love in greek the first word is eros that is erotic love physical love bodily love the second one is philia that is about friendly friendship love the third one is storge about the love that can happen between an elder and a younger or that happens in a family paul does not use these three words he does not use eros he does not use philia he does not use storge but he uses agape agape is a kind of a self giving love whereby one feels less about himself or herself and feels more about the other person so love, love that is totally self giving so paul in a way when he tells faith hope and love he talks about love as a kind of a self giving love ultimately manifested by jesus later as mentioned in his later writings then number 6 christ resurrection gives hope for our resurrection that is the foundation of faith which we are going to celebrate next sunday we are going to celebrate the resurrection of the lord and that is the foundation for our resurrection that's why paul tells if christ had not risen from the dead our preaching is in vain and your faith also is in vain so the preaching is not possible faith also is not possible because christ power christ resurrection is the foundation of our faith these are the lessons from first corinthians coming to the second corinthians the first expression that i like the most is the god of all comfort so paul himself is afflicted really we must appreciate paul even though he is afflicted even though he is sad he beautifully tells that our god is the god of consolation god of comfort so that way he takes consolation in being with god and he encourages other people also to do the same then the fragrance of christ ministering people so through ministers christ only ministers so it's not the minister who is important but the christ third one being changed by god's glory so god's glory and within a moment of time god can change everything so we are called to be called to be touched by god's glory that is kind of a reconciliation paul talks the treasure in clay pot so paul uses another example clay pot it refers to kind of a clay vessels during paul's time were used to collect human waste so paul takes a particular metaphor and tells if that particular clay pot contained treasure how valuable that clay pot would be so the treasure is god's call clay pot is a human nature so god's call adds beauty or adds glory to our life then he talks about walking by faith not by sight this is another good expression we have then he talks about his ministry as ministry of reconciliation he talks about hardships holiness and joy and sowing generously like you give away generously generosity is now emphasized because paul wants to collect from corinth because this is a business capital he wants to collect money and send to jerusalem then paul's vision then finally he feels that uh, the thorn in the flesh often times people ask this question what is the thorn in the flesh which paul is talking some people say this must be some ailment the disease paul may be suffering or his old age or some kind of inconvenience that he faces in the ministry some people say it refers to his past life of uh, doing things against god or uh, going or before conversion his life so paul in a way thinks of that and feels sorry for it so these are different interpretations but from the text we really don't have what is the reference to paul's thorn in the flesh finally the ultimate message that paul gives us here is amidst all the tribulations suffering that my grace is sufficient for you that's the message he receives from christ and that could be the message that he wants us to take from the second corinthians so we stop here we have our assessment number 1 what is to corinthianize me to practice fornication was the corinthian church divided 
all Apollo's KFAS actions? What is the greatest charism love? How many letters did Paul write to the Corinthians? Four letters and four visits, and we, we have missed two. Then who consoles Paul in adverse circumstances? God himself. What is the most personal letter of Paul? Second Corinthians. What is Paul's attitude towards women? He respects women. What is the temple of the Holy Spirit in 1 Corinthians? Body. Who diverted the Corinthian community from Paul? That is unnamed opponents. Are we allowed to eat the food offered to the idols? Yes. Only we need to make sure that nobody's faith is disturbed. Good. So these are the paragraph questions. Not on the cultural ambience of Corinth. How does Paul claim his right as an apostle? Then the problem in the Last Supper. Paul in teaching on the resurrection. Then important themes on the first defense speech in Second Corinthians, mainly about reconciliation. Then the foolish boasting in the second defense speech, like Paul makes two defenses, like they are closely related to each other. How Paul defends his position as an apostle. Good. So we conclude the lesson here. If you have any other doubt, you are welcome to ask. So we began with a prayer reading from 1st Corinthians 13. Then we went to the basic background, historical, theological, literary backgrounds to these two letters. Then we ran through the letters. Then we have come to the significance. Meanwhile, we discussed the questions that came from Mr. Ravi Kumar and Mr. Emmanuel. Any other doubt you have? Father. Yes, Mr. Emmanuel. Father, uh, as per 2nd Corinthians, 2nd chapter 5 8, uh, he says yes. that, uh, uh, so I beg you to refrain from your love for him. So he. Okay. St. Paul uh, uh, forgives that uh, a man who did fornication. Uh, is he referring uh, to that man only, Father, in 2nd Corinthians? Which is that 1st uh, Corinthians 5, that immoral man he mentioned. Please tell that text again. 2nd Corinthians, 2nd chapter, Father. Father. Yeah. 5 to 8. Okay. But if anyone has caused pain, he has caused it not to me, but in some measure, not to put it too severely to you all. For such a one, this punishment by the majority is enough. So you should rather turn to forgive and comfort him, or he may be overwhelmed with excessive sorrow. So yeah. I beg you to re of him your love for him. Does he mention the same man, Father? No, here he makes a kind of a general. So here it is General. like anyone causes a sin, um, commits sin, commits a kind of a, it affects the community. So that they, how the community has to defend. This is how he starts. So it is, it is a general thing. General. Okay. General thing, Mr. Manuel. One more thing, Father. Yeah. In Second Corinthians chapter 12, Paul's uh, revelation of uh, that yeah. uh, vision is it happened at uh, on the way to Damascus or uh, in Jerusalem or in Antioch, okay. Father? So here, all we said earlier, Paul's conversion story it has little problem. Like when Paul talks about revelation, he mentions kind of a personal revelation that would have happened in different places: Jerusalem, Antioch, or even Arabia. But when it comes to the Acts, we have different version from Luke where he tells on the way to uh, Dhamma. Okay. Chapter 12, we cannot say. Yeah, we exactly cannot say this is a kind of a personal way. revelation. Personal revelation. So, Father, thank you. Thank you. Very good, Mr. Father, Peter. one question, Father. Yes, Mr. Vita. In second in second Corinthians 18, if you can see that uh, this 18, which uh, uh, gospel, uh, which gospel, uh, uh, I mean, uh, the uh, it's uh, saying, Father, that uh, 
Once again, once again, please tell me the text. In, the, in eight, 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 chapter eight. Second Corinthians. Also, eighteen, eight. father. Second Corinthians, no. Hello. Hello, Mr. Victor. Second Corinthians. Uh, Am I correct? Yes, father. Yes, second yes. Corinthians. Yes, second Corinthians. Eight, eight chapter, eight verses, eighteen. Okay. Which which one is referring? Which 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 uh, gospel writer is writing here? Is referring here, father? With him, we have sent the brother who is praised in all the churches for his preaching of the gospel. So this is the text. Mm -hmm. So the text refers to who? Okay. So the ref the it could be it could refer to kind of a false co-worker or a companion. Co-worker. Co oh. Yeah, co-worker. Yeah. Okay. So in second column, okay. eight twenty-two also we have a similar. Eight twenty-two. Ah. Yes, yes, them, twenty-two we also similar. Yeah, same thing. So this might refer yes, to yes, his yes. companion, co-worker. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank Victor. you, Father. Okay. Very good. One thing final for final only. Last one, Thank Father. You, then. Father, last one, Father. Yes, Mr. Emmanuel. Second Corinthians 7 10, yes. Father. Uh, for godly grief okay. produces a repentance that leads to salvation and brings no regret, but worldly grief produces death. Yeah. Uh, in uh, some uh, compare uh, this uh, word, uh, this thing with uh, the repentance of uh, uh, Saint Peter and uh, Iscariot Judah. I see. How do they say? For godly uh, for godly grief produces a repentance that leads okay. to salvation and brings no regret. That okay. is for Peter, Saint Peter. But worldly okay. grief produces death. That is for okay. Judah. Mm -hmm. But I have not come across, but I don't know whether Judas repentance could be kind of a worldly sorrow or whether Judas and in, in, in Saint Ignatius comment it is there, Father. I see. Okay, okay. This could be a kind of evangelical interpretation we need that. Because Paul never intended when he wrote that. This kind of he just makes a statement. This could be only oh. interpreted. Okay, good. Thank you. Thank you. Very good. Good. Then we call it a day. Thank you for your participation in the class. And all the best for your celebrations of the Holy Week. Let us pray that this week becomes really a kind of a week of grace for every one of us. Good. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without the end. Amen. Thank you very much. God thank, you, thank, thank, you. You. thank you, Father. 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 Thank you, Father.